Hello, good morning, everyone. Hopefully, you can hear me. All good reverb functions, so I'll, I'll keep this short. Um, so I'm Andrew Coffrey of Food Project Consultants. Um, it's my responsibility to organize the CPA events for CPA. Today's presentation is about the 2023 Red List. Um, which we're all aware the new Red List came into effect on the first day of September. Certain locations will see notable changes to those values. I know that in our neck of the world, Sussex Township, we have an increased industrial market significantly. Um, you um, would be able to learn more than that, uh, which means the nature of the public. Yeah, sorry, we do have some issues on the sound. to try something. So yeah, so that makes it different. Okay. I can. It's still a little. Sorry, speak again. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah, it seems a little bit okay, better. Okay. So, apologies, uh, everybody. It seems to be back. Sorry, it's still not great. Um, but I'll keep this short and sweet for the parts I need to draw. I think we've got a better sound quality. Um, so, I'm going to stick out a few things I was going to say uh, and just uh, introduce Jordan from Andrew Holman, who's currently doing a presentation with us today. She's a leading expert. Um, quick apology on behalf of Tiffany Green uh, for the flu, who's supposed to be uh, joining the presentation for Jordan. He's had to withdraw. Uh, a quick thank you to the end of Pedro Martin, who's all part of the tech for this presentation. So I'll stop and pass over to you, Jordan. Thank you very much. Um, just to check, I suppose, can everyone hear me okay before I start? Yeah, okay. I will crack on, but do let me know and um, we can hopefully get to the, the bottom of it. Ah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, so our agenda today um, is first of all to go through some rating basics um, with reference to the 2023 rating list. Um, we'll talk through the reliefs that are currently available to rateable occupiers. We will then discuss um, rating mitigation, so how we get business rates down or remove them altogether for clients and rateable occupiers. I will then take you through the check challenge appeal process and how we are finding this at the moment and specifically how we are finding dealing with the VOA and timescales and things like that. I will then touch on the 2023 revaluation and how the main sectors have been impacted since the 2023 rating list came into force. And I'm then just going to finish with a couple of case studies, which I hope you will find interesting. So rating basics to start with. So what are business rates? Um, they are, of course, a tax on the occupiers of land and the buildings that they occupy. The current system was actually established on the 1st of April 1990 and local authorities or our billing authorities collect business rates and rateable values are in fact determined by the Valuation Office Agency or VOA who I will mention a lot today um, and they are part of HMRC and they of course carry, a, carry out national revaluations and issue new rating lists periodically. So here are a few of the more important and most relevant items of rating legislation. So the first of these is the General Rating Act of 1967. And this consolidated practically the whole of statute law on rating 
um, and consolidated more than 30 statutes which existed prior to the General Rate Act into one single statute. Um, the Local Government Finance Act of 1988 then came along um, and rewrote rating legislation once again. This abolished the local authority's role in setting the rate applicable to non-domestic property and moved this to the VOA. We then have the Rating Valuation Act of 1999, which again amended the Local Government Finance Act of 1988. And this requires that properties in England or Wales, which are subject to non-domestic rating, are valued for that purpose based on the assumption that the property is in a reasonable state of repair. So this assumption applies no matter what the actual condition of the property and is quite important when it comes to rating valuation. So how do we define rateable value? A rateable property is known as a hereditament and rates are levied on the basis of the value of the occupation of the property to the occupier of the property and so the value of the occupation to that occupier or to that business. The value of the occupation or the non-domestic rates liability of an individual hereditament is calculated using the open market rental value of the property as estimated by the Valuation Office Agency on the Antecedent Valuation Date, or AVD. The AVD falls two years before the date of a revaluation, so that means that the Antecedent Valuation Date for the current 2023 rating list is the 1st of April 2021. So this estimate of open market rental value then of course becomes known as the property or hereditament's rateable value. And the Local Government Finance Act actually sets out seven assumptions for rating valuation, which are based upon a hypothetical tenancy. So as you can see here, the elements that make up this hypothetical tenancy are that the property must be vacant, it must be available to let on an annual tenancy, that it must be available to let on full repairing and insuring terms, that it must be in good repair. It is assumed that the tenant pays rates, that the property is and will remain in its current use and that no alterations or in reality only very minor opera um, operations, alterations have been made to that property. These here are the factors that are used to determine whether or not an occupier is actually rateable. So to be a rateable occupier, you must fulfill these four essential ingredients. The first being actual occupation or your physical presence in the property. The second being exclusive occupation or paramount occupation. So this means that the occupier does not share the property with another occupier. It is solely theirs. Uh, the third factor is beneficial occupation. So this means that the occupation must have some tangible benefit to that occupier. And lastly, it's important that the occupation is not for too transient a period. So this means that there must be an uninterrupted period of continuous possession for that occupier. These are the factors that make a hereditament or property rateable. So there must be a single rateable occupier the property must be located in a billing authority. It must be capable of separate occupation. The property must be a single geographical unit. It must have just one single use and it must be in a single definable position. And those are the six essential ingredients for a property to become rateable. So moving on now to the three methods of valuation that we use in rating to determine a, rateables, a property's rateable value. The first of these is the comparable method, which is of course used to value properties such as shops, industrial units and offices. Um, the rateable value here will reflect open market evidence at the antecedent valuation date based on market evidence, which is gathered in the lead up to the revaluation, ideally on the revaluation date. So the 1st of April, 2021 at the moment. How the RV is calculated in this instance is of course dependent on the hereditament type. Um, so industrial offices and restaurants, for example, are all valued on a rate per square meter basis. But in the uh, case of high street rate retail premises, the VOA will base their valuation on a rate per square meter in terms of zone A, of course, being the premise that the area at the front of the shop is in fact the most valuable. Moving on, rating method valuation number two is the contractor's method. 
So this is used for the more unusual properties. So that might be a school or a hospital, for example. And the contractor's method of valuation involves estimating the cost of replacing the property in question with a similar property of the same size, quality and function. And this calculation of estimated cost is then adjusted for any depreciation or obsolescence that may have occurred since the property was built. Finally, we have the profits method of valuation. So this is used to determine the rateable value of trading properties, such as hotels, pubs or holiday parks. The VOA determine a fair maintainable turnover figure or FMT for the property, and they then apply a percentage to this to generate the rateable value. And these FMT figures are informed by data that the VOA gathers from occupiers of these properties in the lead up to a revaluation via a request for information forms that they will send out. Um, so some examples of how profits methods valuations are, well, not how the valuation itself is calculated, but how the rateable value is arrived at. Um, so in the case of hotels, the valuation office take the FMT of the hotel in its entirety they then look at the accommodation receipts as a percentage of the total turnover. And this then determines in quite a lot, there's very large tables breaking down um, the accommodation values and what, what the percentages of the total are. And that table then informs a percentage to be applied to the overall turnover. And that generates your rateable value for a hotel. Uh, in the case of self-catering holiday lets, the VOA will apply a price per single bed space to the accommodation can range from, well, I've seen anything between 300 per bed space to 2,900 per bed space. Um, or if the holiday accommodation makes up more of a complex, so five units or more, they will again apply a percentage to the overall turnover of that holiday complex. In the case of pubs, the turnover is divided into wet, dry accommodation and other income. So wet being drinks and dry being food. And a percentage is then applied to each category depending on the location, um, quality facilities offered at, at, at that unit. And these are all then combined to arrive at a total one RV again. Um, and finally, wedding venues. Again, we use the turnover, but the percentage applied to that turnover is determined on a sliding scale, depending on the offering at that wedding venue. Um, so the percentage chosen will be in a range of four to 10%. Um, for, so that, that's for fully staffed and fully catered venues where the input from the operator is quite high and where it's just a venue standalone, very little input from the operator, it will be between eight and 15%. So the higher rates apply where there is high use and little of any service actually applied by the operator itself. So when rateable values are calculated using the comparable method, information on how the rateable value is actually calculated is publicly available and can be found at found at um, www.findyourbusinessrates. Um, so anyone can go on there and have a look at the rateable value of any property if it, if it takes their fancy or when looking for on behalf of clients or potential clients. But where the rateable values are calculated using the contractors or profits method, only those who occupy the property or their agent who can actually prove their link to that property are able to see how the rateable value has been calculated. So the turnover figures and the percentages applied are not publicly available. So in these cases, the property needs to be claimed on the government gateway and the link to the property needs to be proven, usually by uploading a, a business rates bill or title register um, plan or utility bill. If needed, ideally, it would be a business rates bill and you can then request to see the detailed valuation, which is then made available by the VOA within 20 working days. So moving back to how we actually arrive at a business rates bill or a business rates liability. So to do so, the rateable value is multiplied by the appropriate non-domestic rates multiplier, which is determined by central government in each financial year. So as you can see here, the current non-domestic rating multipliers are 49.9 pence in the pound for properties with a rateable value of less than 51,000. So in this context, that is a small business, uh, small business multiplier. And it's 51.2 pence in the pound for those properties with a rateable value exceeding 51,000. So the large business in, in this example. The 1.3 pence difference is known as the small business rate supplement. And this is used to fund the small business rate relief scheme during a rating list. 
So it's worth noting, of course, that the multipliers have been frozen in recent years since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic with the intention of providing some stability to businesses, both during and now as they're emerging from the pandemic. The multiplier is normally announced by the Chancellor of the Exchequer at uh, the autumn budget statement. So at present, we only know that the multipliers will remain at this level until the 31st of March 2024. So bringing all that together, rates payable are therefore determined by the business rates multiplier or the UBR. This is multiplied by the rateable value and then reliefs are taken off the, the business rates liability. So reliefs could be an adjustment for transitional relief, which I will touch on in a moment. And when transitional relief has been taken off, the bill is then again adjusted for any reliefs or exemptions which may apply to that occupier. So that takes me quite nicely on to um, the main reliefs that we get asked about and those that clients and occupiers are most likely to benefit from during the 2023 rating list. So first of all um, is transitional relief, which is very important at the time of a revaluation. So this limits how much a bill can change each year as the result of a revaluation. And if the occupier is eligible, it means that changes to their bill are phased in gradually so that they are not hit with the full force of the increase in their rateable value all at once at the start of a rating list. By law, the government are required to have transitional arrangements in place at the start of each revaluation, but the format can and does change. So you can see on the slide here, this is the current transitional arrangement for the duration of the 2023 rating list. So to take the first example, if the property has a rateable value of up to £20,000 or £28,000 in London, their increased uh, business rates bill will be phased in by 5% this year, 10% plus inflation next year, and 25% plus inflation in the final year of the list. There did used to be a downward cap on transitional relief, but this has been removed for this revaluation, which is excellent news for occupiers who are enjoying a reduction in their rateable value. And it means that they will benefit from the reduction in their business rates bill immediately rather than having this phased in, which has been the case in previous revaluations. So moving on to small business rates relief, um, there has been no change to this as yet uh, during, during the 2023 rating list. So if a property has a rateable value of less than £15,000 and the business only uses one property, they will be eligible for small business rates relief. Um, there are exceptions to businesses using more than one property here, as you can see. So if none of the other properties have a rateable value above 2,899 and the total rateable value of all the properties is less than 20,000 or 28,000 in London, that business may qualify for small business rates relief on more than one property. But in, in practice, this I, I personally haven't seen that, um, the quite strict criteria, which we, we don't often see met. So occupiers, assuming all these criteria are met or they only occupy one property, they will not pay business rates on that property with a rateable value of 12,000 or less. And for properties with a rateable value of 12,001 pounds to 15,000 pounds, the rate of relief will go down gradually from 100% to 0% between those two boundaries. Something new which has been introduced for this list is the supporting small business scheme, which is worth over 500 million pounds and it was introduced by the government to assist those properties and those business owners who are losing their small business rates relief as a result of their rateable values increasing either above 12,000 or above the 15,000 pound limit. And this means that no occupier will see a bill increase by more than 600 pounds this year, which is fantastic for occupiers for, for this current year. But we again, we don't know if this will be extended next year or if it will be increased, decreased or, or scrapped altogether. So I think at the moment it's potentially masking some quite large interests for um, interest increases for occupiers and they may start to feel the, the real hit of that in the in the next financial year from next April. Moving on, um, empty property relief. Again, this remains the same at present. So this applies when a building becomes vacant. So in the case of an office or a retail unit, for example, when the property becomes vacant, the, the most recent occupier and the building itself will have empty property relief applied to it for a three month period. 
um, and this is increased to six months if the property is industrial. And then after this time, most businesses do revert to paying full business rates relief, full business rates on vacant properties, with the exceptions that you see here. So if the property is listed, um, if it has an RV below 2,900, or if the property is owned by a charity, the um, empty property relief applies indefinitely and the will continue to enjoy that. Moving on, um, so there was a change to retail, leisure and hospitality relief at the beginning of the 2023 rating list. This was introduced to support businesses through the COVID-19 pandemic and applies if the business is mainly being used as a shop, a restaurant, cafe or pub, a cinema or music venue or a hospitality or leisure business. So this does capture a really broad range of properties and means that those occupiers will get 75% relief until the 31st of March 2026. And this is up to a total value of £110,000 per business. This is in fact an increase from last year when the relief was 50%. Again, we don't know yet if this will be upheld next year, but certainly in the meantime, it is protecting many occupiers from increases in rateable value and is also helping in general um, with leisure businesses that may be suffering due to the cost of living crisis. Sorry, mind glitched there, it didn't disappear on you. Um, so moving on, we also have charitable relief available, which remains unchanged in the 2023 rating list. The Local Government Finance Act of 1988 requires local authorities to grant mandatory rate relief to registered charities, village post offices, general stores, specialist food shops, public houses and petrol filling stations, whether in a designated rural settlement. And it also gives local authorities the power to grant discretionary rate relief, which can top up the 80% charitable relief pending the outcome of an application to 100% relief if it is deemed necessary by that local authority. Finally, we have rural rate relief, which again remains unchanged in the 2023 rating list. This is available if a business is located in a rural area with a population below 3000. And the relief applies if the business is in an eligible area and is either the only village shop or post office with a rateable value of up to £8,500, or if it is the only public house or petrol station with a rateable value of up to £12,500. So that brings us to the end of reliefs and how they have changed or indeed stayed the same during well, the 2023 rating list thus far. So now moving on to business rates mitigation. Business rates can be, as we all know, um, a very onerous liability for some rateable occupiers, and we are therefore often approached to assist clients in mitigating their business rates where possible. So there are really five main ways that this can be done, which I will take you through now. So as you can see here, business rates mitigation be can be achieved through what we call RV zero or removing the property from the rating list during a period of works. Um, it can also be achieved by arranging temporary occupation of the property. This can be done either using a Bluetooth device or storing items within that property. I'll go into that in a bit more detail in just a moment. Um, and we can also achieve mitigation by applying to the VOA either to split a property or to merge a property back in with another. So what exactly do we mean by RV0? So as I just mentioned, if a property that is occupied is undergoing significant reconfiguration or redevelopment, and there is a programme of works in place, it may be possible to temporarily remove that property from the rating list and to have the business rates liability reduced to zero whilst the schedule of works is ongoing and whilst the property is incapable of beneficial occupation. This is done via an application made on the government gateway using the check challenge appeal process and it is necessary to draft a submission which includes evidence in support of the application. So applications to have properties removed from the rating list in this way are based on the case law that you can see here. So in New Begin versus Monk, in March 2017, the Supreme Court held that on the relevant date, the property was not capable of being occupied as offices and was genuinely a property undergoing substantial works or reconstruction. In this case, the property could not be occupied as it had no services and no ceiling tiles and parts of the raised floors had been removed. 
While the repairs would have been considered economical to carry out, the court held that this did not constitute the assumption of reasonable repair as the property was undergoing reconstruction. So this is really important as I, it goes against the proposed um, element of the hypothetical tenancy where we are told to assume that the property is in good repair. And it's also important as it is not always possible to have properties removed from the rating list if they can be considered economical to repair. So it wouldn't be good enough to remove a roof from a property, for example, and say that it cannot be repaired. It needs to be a real schedule of works that can be evidenced with photographs and with written documentation to show that at a material day, the property cannot be beneficially occupied by a rateable occupier. This was confirmed further in Canary Wharf v Jackson in 2019. Following the vacation of the previous tenants, each floor of an office building had been stripped back to a shell condition, although the fitting out works were not scheduled to be undertaken until after a tenant was identified. In this case, the upper tribunal held that the separation over time of the stripping out from the fitting out for the new tenant did not prevent the premises from being under reconstruction. I think this case is really important and I have successfully used it to win um, checks and challenges in fact with the VOA um, when, when applying to have properties removed from the rating list because there can be periods when properties have been stripped out and there is a delay for whatever reason. Um, I have an example of a client being delayed simply due to COVID um, and the cost, the cost of materials going up, difficulty in getting um, construction workers to site. And I quoted Canary Wharf versus Jackson in that in that check, which subsequently went to challenge uh, to say that the VOA did in fact need to remove that property from the rating list as um, the premises were incapable of beneficial occupation, even though there had been a delay between the original stripping out period and the property works being completed. So moving on to Bluetooth. So it's possible to arrange temporary occupation of a property using a Bluetooth device. And this is supported by the ruling in Sunderland City Council versus Sterling Investment Properties of 2013, in which the court held that a 43 day occupancy of a vacant 15,000 square foot unit, for the installation of a small Wi-Fi transmitter box was sufficient to trigger a new rates exemption period for the owner, as this was enough to constitute occupation of the unit. So in practice, this involves installing the equipment, informing the local authority of the new tenant, and after six weeks, removing the equipment, and again, informing the local authority that the business rates liability should then return to the property owner rather than the Bluetooth provider. Temporary occupation can also be arranged without the need to use a Bluetooth device, as long as the occupation can be proven to fulfill the four elements of rateable occupation mentioned earlier. This was confirmed in Macro Properties versus Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council, in which the occupier used a very small part of a large warehouse, uh, so which is approximately 0.2% of the total floor space to store a pallet of documents. This was intended to use the six month exemption period uh, for that industrial property when the pallet was removed. And the High Court confirmed uh, that the occupier was in occupation just by using some pallets uh, to create beneficial occupation um, by storing documents that they very much needed to store for the purposes of their business. And it was confirmed that the claimant could claim empty property rate relief at the end of this occupation. Mitigation can also be achieved either by splitting or merging a property. So if a property such as an office suite is or becomes separately let to a separate tenant, it is possible to apply to the VOA to have a new hereditament created which will create a new business rates liability for the new tenant and reduce the overall business rates liability for the original occupier. I do find these are more successful when submitted with full scaled floor plans, photographs and full lease details. It avoids any back and forth with the VOA. Um, it's also of course possible to do the opposite and merge a property if required. This can be done where two or more hereditaments are occupied by the same person and meet the contiguity condition, which was confirmed in the Woolway versus Mazars case. Um, when this is confirmed and the properties are merged, they will then be assessed as one hereditament and the old hereditaments will be removed from the rating list. Premises are considered contiguous if they are on consecutive floors of a building and if some or all of the floor of one hereditament lies above all or part of the ceiling of the other hereditament, 
or if they share a common wall, fence or other means of enclosure. This doesn't only apply to offices, although it does feel naturally, quite naturally like it would, but neighbouring properties of any type which share an occupier and which are contiguous can be merged. So we have, for example, done this for industrial unit occupiers and holiday lets as well. And the benefit of merging the properties is that the rate per square metre will likely be reduced to reflect the greater size of the merged property. So that's mitigation. I'll now move on to the check challenge appeal process. So this is how we actually go about appealing a rateable value if we think it's wrong. So there are two parts to a property's valuation. These are the factual details, such as the floor areas, car parking spaces, or number of rooms. And there is the value of these aspects of the property. The check challenge appeal system was first introduced on the 1st of April 2017, and it allows ratepayers or their representatives to advise the VOA if there should be a change to the property's rateable value. This remains completely unchanged in the 2023 rating list. So the check stage is used to disclose or amend factual information about a property, again, such as the floor area, parking or inclusion or otherwise of air conditioning, CCTV cameras, for example. These are all factual details and they can affect the rateable value of a property. If you want to challenge the value of a property, you still do need to agree the correct factual details with the VOA. So this is called a check case and a check cannot be avoided even if there's actually no issue with the factual details of the property, it's still part of the process which needs to be followed. So a check case must be sent as I said, even if the details are correct, if you want to tell the VOA about something that's affected the land or the property that isn't in your control, if you want to move on to challenge the rateable value, or if you want to do simple things like change the address, change the main use or description of the property, or change the date that a change to the property occurred. You can also send a check case to the, tell the VOA that the property has been split into more than one, as I've just mentioned. Also, similarly, a check is submitted to confirm that the property should be merged with another property. And it must also be followed to advise the VOA that a property has been demolished or that it is being renovated. So to achieve an RV zero on that property. And it must also be used, the, it being the check stage, if there has been a change in the local area affecting the property. So a material change in circumstances that the VOA need to know about. When a check is submitted, the VOA usually issue a decision notice within 12 weeks, but this can take up to 12 months, depending on the complexity of the case and the caseworker's workload. This, again, this remains unchanged at present. I've seen, I did see a flurry of check cases come back immediately after the 31st of March deadline. Um, so quite a few came through early April, um, but there are still many, many outstanding from the 2017 list and the response times do vary significantly. So after the check stage, of course, comes the challenge stage. Here, it is possible to present a well-evidenced argument to the VOA that the rate per square meter used in the valuation of the property is incorrect. This can also be done to argue that the FMT used in the valuation or the percentages applied to the FMT in evaluation are correct in the case, incorrect, sorry, in the case of a trading property. So preparing a challenge requires research within the same valuation scheme as the property, consideration of the actual lease and rent of the property, and detailed research for comparable evidence, as well as valuation tribunal decisions for the property type. The challenge will not be accepted by the VOA if it is not submitted on one ground, these being that the valuation was wrong when the rating list was created, that there's been a change to the property or surrounding area that should be shown in the rateable value, that a change made to the valuation by the VOA is wrong or hasn't been made, that the date of a change made by the VOA is wrong, that the property should be split into more than one property or combined with others into a single property, that the property should be removed from or added to the rating list, that the valuation is wrong due to a legal decision on another property, or finally, that the property details are wrong or incomplete. A challenge must be submitted within four months of a check decision and then the actual result of that challenge can take up to 18 months to receive. In practice, that most definitely does happen. It is usually between 12 and 18 months. 
Um, after this, it is then possible to appeal the decision if necessary by applying to the Valuation Tribunal Service. And of course, throughout this entire period, rates at the original level based on the rateable value in dispute must continue to be paid by the occupier or else they will get themselves in some trouble with the local authority. So uh, towards the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that the valuation office carry out, carry out national revaluations and issue new rating lists. So I've been talking about the revaluation, what the impact's been on the reliefs that we have available, um, but I thought it worth just touching on what a revaluation actually is and why we have them. So revaluations occur periodically to bring rateable values and therefore business rates liabilities in line with market conditions. We have, of course, recently had the first national revaluation in six years. And this means that as of the 1st of April 2023, all businesses were given a new rateable value by the VOA. The antecedent valuation date was, of course, the 1st of April 2021, which was amidst the COVID-19 pandemic there had been lockdowns. Um, so evidence at the antecedent valuation date is imperfect in, in many cases, in many sectors, and arguably missing in some, for example, the leisure sector, hotels and holiday parks had been forced to close. Their accounts were quite very different in the, in the years that were important leading up to the, the revaluation. And the VOA have, have published an update to their rating manual on how property types should be considered. Um, the antecedent valuation date, in my view, has not really been taken into consideration in, in most property types. Um, it's, it's definitely worth looking to that in, in, in detail for the more specialist properties, um, but it, it is really has been based on what was happening at that AVD with some slight adjustments made in some sectors. Uh, the, the guide to rating pubs, for example, has been evaluated to allow for um, valuer discretion when handling the accounts in the lead up to, to the 2021 AVD. So since the 2023 revaluation came into force, we now have 2.14 million non-domestic properties in England and Wales. Together, these properties have a total rateable value of 70.3 billion pounds, which is compared with 65.7 billion in the 2017 rating list. New rateable values should reflect changes in property rental values between the 1st of April 2015 and the 1st of April 2021. But as I just said, um, as this was a difficult valuation time, mistakes may well have been made and there may well be grounds to challenge these new rateable values. I have seen several retail rateable values go up where they were most certainly expected to go down and the new rateable values do not reflect comparable market evidence at the AVD or indeed the um, actual rent in the leases of these properties. So I'm in the process of preparing challenges on that basis, um, but I do think that'd be something to look out for where rateable values don't match the, the rents in the leases and in the neighbouring properties. The, so finally, the 2023 rating list will be three years in duration, ending on the 31st of March 2026. And the government have committed to ensuring that revaluations are every three years into the future, perhaps at even shorter intervals, much further into the future. And this is intended to ensure that rateful values more fairly do reflect um, economic conditions at the AVD um, without having such large gaps in between revaluations. Hopefully this will be the case. So um, this slide here shows a broad breakdown of how the 2023 revaluation has impacted the main sectors. These fig figures were published by the Valuation Office on the 17th of November 2022. So these are based on the draft rating list. It was said that these would be updated in April 2023, so last month, but as yet there is no new information available. So I imagine this will be subject to slight change, but in general it does give an overview of what has happened regionally. Um, I won't read through this in huge detail, but um, as you can see, there has been an all sectors increase of 7.3% overall in England. Um, retail properties, as expected, are benefiting from a 10% decrease overall. Industrial properties are experiencing nearly a 28% increase and offices a 10% increase. And all of those properties that fall into other 
have experienced a 4% increase overall, but other is very broad ranging and there have certainly been winners and losers within those categories. Broadly speaking, I personally have seen holiday parks and hotels in the Southwest, um, their rateable values have gone up hugely um, due to, although they were hit hard in, in some of the COVID years, they also had record turnover in some of the COVID years as well. So that appears to be ha have been unfortunately translated into higher rateable values for those occupiers. Similarly, car showrooms have seen considerable increases. Um, Self-catering holiday units, interestingly, have seen quite a decrease, as have pubs. So just to finish off, I've got a couple of case studies that I would like to share with you, which I hope you will find interesting, just to go through how we put some of this into practice um, in, in real life. Um, so this is a business rates mitigation case study. Um, so this was an office building in Cornwall, which had a rateable value of £157,000. The client appointed Vickery Holman to advise on business rates mitigation strategy during a programme of works that they were carrying out. So planning consent had actually been obtained in 2017 when the client purchased the freehold of the building. And the planning consent was for a change of use from college uh, to office, so D1 to B1 at the time. Works actually began in October 2020 and were due to complete in July 2021. We were instructed quite close to July 2020-21, so we advised the client that a cheque should be submitted as soon as possible on their behalf um, to ensure that the parameters of uh, Monk versus Newbegin were met and that the cheque was submitted whilst the property was incapable of beneficial occupation. Really, really important. If the works are finished, these, these types of cheques simply don't work. Um, so we did submit that check during the programme of works with supporting evidence, contractors invoices, the schedule of works, photographs taken during our inspection. And the property was removed from the rating list throughout those works. And this resulted in a saving of £80,000 for that client. A uh, second example, completely different, um, is just to show how a check and in fact challenge can be carried out on a trading property. So we were instructed by the owner of a rural pub in Devon, which had a rateable value in the 2017 list of 65,800. The client appointed us to review their rateable value as their business was becoming quite unsustainable due to the over £30,000 in business rates they were paying every year. Um, and we did find the level of RV to be very excessive, um, having regard to the nature of the business, the location and the actual levels of trade that they were able to achieve due to their very remote location, tiny catchment area, and actually quite a lot of competition of pubs of a similar nature in the, in the local area. So our key issue here was that the valuation office had adopted a fair maintainable turnover of 695, um, but the actual wet and dry sales at the property had averaged 176,000 pounds over six years and had never exceeded 200,000 pounds. And this meant that the percentage applied to the wet and dry income was also skewed and excessive due to the inflated valuation figures that had been used in the valuation of the property. So we submitted a check to confirm the property details and then com compiled a challenge on the occupier's behalf um, to argue that the new FMT should be adopted reflecting actual trade at the property. Um, so that was £80,000 for the wet sales and £83,000 for the dry sales and that the percentages in the actual valuation should be adjusted to reflect these, these figures. And this resulted in a new rateable value for that client of £12,000, which was an amazing result as they applied, uh, sorry, qualified for 100% small business rates relief and over the life of the 2017 rating list, including the reliefs that were available due to COVID during that time, they still saved in excess of £100,000. And that is me done. Um, if anyone has any questions, I would be absolutely delighted to answer them. Um, I hope you found that valuable and interesting. Can, can you hear me, Jordan? Um, so that sounds as though we haven't yes. got a reverb rush well. we had last time, it was good. Uh, I've kept my camera off, which is no. not for everybody, obviously. Um, thank you very much, Jordan, for a um, really useful and informative presentation. Uh, very grateful for that. Um, and as Jordan has said, my if pleasure. you thank have you. any questions, uh, you'll see a, um, 
there should be a chat box on the right hand side of the uh, your screen um, i'm not sure how that will appear on your phone if you're on the phone but you can type um any questions you've got in there uh, and then jordan will um will do her best to address them so please uh, submit any questions if you've got any now's the time to do it also happy to answer yeah. them if anyone thinks of anything <laughs> in the rest of the okay, day i'm very happy one, to one question i was going to ask is um, well. the um with the, with the way the economy is at the moment and the difficulty that so many people are, are experiencing or occupiers and businesses are experiencing with increased um borrowing costs they've, they've gone up again today to uh, interest rates gone up to four and a half percent utilities have gone up inflation is um very is, is much higher now than it was back in 2021 are you mm -hmm. seeing um a lot more landlords i suppose in particular coming to you looking at ways to try and mitigate their rates liability yeah i actually am and even landlords acting on behalf of tenants at this stage which i hadn't really seen previously it was always the occupier themselves that was the most concerned um but yes absolutely and it's across a range of property types so i, I do think even though transitional relief and the various reliefs that i talked through is as i said masking to an extent um what people are going to face in years to come with their rateable values people do seem to be aware that that indeed that they are masked and that they do need to do something about it so yes i've definitely seen more inquiries coming through and people quoting the reason being they've realized it's one of many costs that they have to face and it is now one that they people seem to be realizing that it is possible to at least look into challenging it and trying yeah, to adjust it to we've certainly benefit. seen down in our neck of the woods um racial values have, have, have doubled on, on some industrial property in particular and uh um yeah. we've had a couple of situations where the tenant uh, simply run out of money or, or going to run out of money um and worked with their landlord say look i'm going to go yeah. i'm going to have to vacate go bust or exercise a break option or whatever it might be um and um because you know, one of my big costs being rates uh, and the landlords agreed to actually come in jointly with them to try to build rates uh, and funded part of the, um, mm -hmm. the cost of doing that um, yeah um, no, and no, had you no, seen no, that in the last um, list it's been it's been Not really. featured this list. No. i think the um the interesting thing or i suppose it's not necessarily interesting but the um the 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 revaluation, as you said, based on 2021 rateable values uh, uh, on on that uh, on market rents in April 2021. In in our yeah. obviously we're in the middle of the pandemic, as you said, but actually in our neck of the woods, the industrial market was incredibly strong in April 21. Um, so and here, yeah, yeah, and probably it peaked around that time in terms of rental values. Um, so people are being hit with rental values based on the peak of the market um and now we're two years on mm. that peak has passed um the, the demand is far softer than it was back then um and they've picked up um massive increases yeah. in utilities bills um as well as um uh but now this much increased rate rates bill so it, it, we're seeing we're seeing occupiers getting bust um and, and ex exercising break options it's forcing people yeah. to um vacate property so it's it's having quite a big effect on the on the market or is starting to at a local mm. level yeah yeah i would agree definitely down in, in the southwest as well oh we've had a question um thank you simon should car parking in offices be part of the hereditament for the office it depends um if the car parking spaces are separated from your office by any land in separate ownership so even a separate footpath or any communal space whatsoever the voa can separate that and make it into a separate assessment because the parking spaces are not contiguous to the office so it's only if they meet the contiguity requirement that they can be merged in with the office assessment so worth a look certainly um but it, it could well be that that is fair unfortunately <laughs> okay um well i think there are no more questions coming in at the moment um and i'm sure everyone is uh their tummies are rumbling and uh 
Um, so I think uh, <laughs> yeah. there, there being no more questions, we'll probably call that, um, bring that to an end. So um, I know we can't show our appreciation for Jordan in a normal way because you, none of us can, none of you can, um, we can't <laughs> hear any of you. Um, but so a big thank you to Jordan from uh, from myself on behalf of um, uh, awesome. everybody. Uh, also to Leslie for um, thank you. setting it all up. Um, and yes, as Jordan said, um, she's um, should be pleased to field any subsequent questions. Um, if you've got any, please uh, feel free to um, to email your guest, Jordan. Mm, yeah, definitely. And sometimes it's nice just to talk through different different queries and different experiences as well. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, um, get in touch. Here's to the, to, um, to the next Thank couple of weeks and I'll have another CPD event coming out in uh, hopefully sort of late June, early July. I'll be in contact with that. So thank you all. Fantastic. Cheerio. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Bye bye.